Hi. Hello. We're back. <laughs> We're back. It's six months nearly since uh, yeah. October. Yeah. Uh, and the night, so we've drawn in. Yeah, it's Missing been a long it. time. So we thought we'd give this a go again. Uh, yeah. See if we're lucky, hopefully you can see us and we're not just talking to a camera <laughs> and talking to ourselves. Um, I know the chat is going live. Yeah. yeah we, we've got like uh, Vienna, Mexico, Slovenia, Slovenian chicken sandwich in fact. <laughs> we've got, I see there. That's right. UK. India. Uh, yeah. Philippines. Wow. Australia. Zambia. Thank you wow. for all Thanks tuning in. Thanks for tuning in guys, that's amazing. So uh, we're going to try this again, this live interactive Box streaming program. So yeah. you just shout out the stuff in the chat, and we will aim to uh, to show you. If you don't know it, we'll just make it up. And Eric Kim was the first person to put in a request. Eric, thanks very much. Uh, he was all organised yesterday, and he asked a question. So, do you consider the ESP a superficial or a deep block for patients with bleeding risk? So, uh, and then he said, yeah. "For uh, we'll, we'll go to your second question in a second. Let's just talk about the ESP. Do you want to?" Talk about ESP first, or can you scan and talk? Can you can walk and chew, chew gum? gum at the same time? <laughs> mm, I will do my best. Um, yeah, so we'll let's scan at the same time while we do this. So we'll we'll have a we'll put on the the scan cam. Last the last time we called the James cam, and we realised that James is such a fantastic model, an ultrasound model yeah. that um, Welcome. we have. Uh, we're <laughs> James Maher. Uh, and we've got fellow we've got, from fellow, fellow from Duke, and we've got a few thank yous here behind the uh, yeah behind the camp the scenes here. We've got Mike and Mike. We have all our fellows named the same age, same the same the same name because I'm a certain age. It makes it easier for me to remember. But two UNC fellows are here helping us out behind the camera yeah, as well. Thanks, thanks Mike's. Uh, thanks to Mike's. Um, so let's see if we can get that picture and picture view. So there's right, there Jeff go. in the corner scanning, and um, let's look for the ESP block. Yeah, so what we're gonna do, I always start out more lateral than you have to be because ribs are really, really easy to recognize. So here we got a rib. And I'm gonna just get our arrow here. So nice osseous rib casting a big shadow. And the rib looks kind of rounded, right? And there's pleura. So it's rounded, bony structure plus pleura equals rib. And from there you want to slide the needle and you're tracking that rib. And at some point you're gonna see a transition. Still got rib. Still got rib. Two. Boom. See that? That was a transverse process. So we have the, the more squared off transverse process. Here's one over here on this side. And this is our erector spinae muscle on top. And you can see the underlying fascia of erector spinae. And what you want to do is get yourself a view like that, where you have sort of two adjacent transverse processes. This is all intercostal muscle here underneath. And one of the um, technical tips we just learned through trial and error over the years is, is not to hit the top of the transverse process and end up sort of intramuscular, but rather come in either from cephalad or from caudad and kind of hit the corner. You want to be below that hammock of epimecium that's hanging down in between and sort of hit the corner right there and then sort of lift the muscle up. But I'll do this transition from rib to TP, rib to TP, a couple of times just to make sure that I've got the right structure. Um, and I consider it a, a superficial block. I'm not put off by anticoagulation. In fact, this is an indication for me to do this block in someone who comes up with rib fractures on DOAX or other anticoagulants compared to an epidural or a paravertebral. Yeah, and, and Eric, remember, uh, the, the real problem with the epidural is that this, the really bad consequences if we get a hematoma in um, <clears throat> if we get a if we get a hematoma within the central neuraxis. The beauty of this is the risk. Well, you could have a hematoma, but the consequences are not the same. So I'm the same as Jeff. I I will do this in people who are on uh, oral anticoagulants, one of a million varieties um, of the. Maybe if they're supposed to be stopped for three days, I don't mind doing it if they're only stopped a couple with this one. And yes, and I think it then becomes into indications. Where's the real benefit versus the downside? Yep. Um, you know, the blocks can be a real benefit um, f for this individual. I'm, I'm more likely to push it in somebody who's, who's, who's anticoagulated. Yeah, for um, sure. I still like to follow the guidelines where I can, get them stopped, but this is a great alternative for... for, for yeah, 
The first, the first ESP catheter I ever did was on someone who had on plavix, rib fractures, and he was not looking good. And we did this, and it just, he went from needing to be intubated almost to, oh, that feels good. Can I go home now? Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that's great. Now, if you're doing a lumbar ESP, we do this a lot for spine surgery. Yeah, we've spine? got a, a new spine yeah. surgeon who's keen as mustard on these. <clears throat> keen as mustard. Yeah. All right. Food reference number one. And... Uh, <laughs> So it's a little bit different, right? Because there, there are no ribs to guide you from lateral. So what I'll do is I'll put the probe on the, um, the lumbar spine area. You can obviously track down and find yourself, find the sacrum. So there's James's sacrum, and we're centering L5S1 in the middle. I'll put that on oh, just to put there. So yeah, there's the sacrum. sacrum. Yep, there, got L5S1 interspace, and you can see the pulsations of the CSF. I look right all the way down here. What's yeah. that right line? There you go. It's an anterior complex, an yeah. anterior complex. You see that you can actually see his L5, spinal canal. The space, yeah. Yep. L4. So yep. L4, all the way five. down there at the complex again. Yeah. Yeah. So there's three. Yep. And again, I want an epidural needle right now. Oh, yeah. Give me a needle. <laughs> all right. So once I've got a, about the L3 or L2 lamina, which I have here, I'll start to scan out lateral. So those are articular facets. And then I get to transverse processes. And I'll keep going until I just get soft tissue. And there we go. So all I see now is soft tissue on the screen. Kind of a no man's land. And then I'll come back until boom, I've got that first ridge of a transverse process casting a big old shadow down there. And I got another one. Uh, let me go here. There we go. So I can't do two. I can't do two things. You can't do two things, things at once. So I'll so move the arrow here. I'm at one so there, here. There are two transverse processes. So I'll stop shadow. there. Yep. And, and that's a good spot. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, I'm not as concerned about getting the local deep into the psoas. In fact, I just I just want to contact the transverse process and put it there because I'm kind of actually after just a dorsal ramus block in this case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that. And the T-lip is kind of a variation of this, but you're going a little bit further out and hope maybe to avoid, if, if you did do the T-lip, you're going a little bit further out and maybe you're trying to avoid some of the, the central spread yeah. by putting that local a bit further out. Have you tried, tried that in any of your patients? We've tried. Uh, the problem we found is with the T-lip is trying to find and define that intramuscular fascial plane. Exactly. My patients come in for back surgery don't have the beautiful muscles <laughs> yeah. that allow me to do that. So I'm kind of like, mm, okay, um, yeah, I found exactly the same yeah. thing. So that's a good one. Yeah. So what's next? Next question he said was ambulatory hips. Are you send any of your hip arthroplasties home same day? Most of them. Yep. yep. So he said if for an ambulatory um, same day hip arth arthroplasty, a peng or a QL3 reasonable? Oh, yeah. Peng. 10 days out of 10. Definitely over the over that QLT or the anterior quadratus lumborum. No. I'm definitely going to be paying. People, I've heard, heard of people having great success with QL for hip, but I, to me, that's an abdominal block. Uh, I, I, we use it more for abdominal stuff. But I mean, uh, you're putting in at the... You're putting in the lumbar level. It should be near the lumbar plexus. I just worry when I looked at... The, you know the amount of motor block you're going to get with that. I just I, that that's one of my worries. But let, let's let's try scanning the that just now. The, like, yeah, okay. QL. So there are <clears throat> you know different varieties of QL, different approaches to do this. Uh, I'm a simple guy. I get easily confused by soft tissue, so uh, I like to use bones as a bones, okay. bones don't lie. Bones like, don't lie. No. Okay. All right. Okay. Percent. So I'm going to feel for his iliac crest. Draw a line down like that with my finger, put the probe on transversely over the midline. Now what I can see here is the shadow of the spinous process. I've got the lamina coming out here to either side. And as I go lateral, I'm gonna be looking for the next drop off, boom, and there it is. And there's a nice bright bony structure that's a transverse process. Okay, so spinous, lamina, transverse process, casting a shadow. And now I'm going to go further out lateral. I lose a transit process. I just tilt and shift till I bring it back. And as I go out, I'm going to rotate the probe a bit as well until I got that transit process more or less pointing up. And you can see we've got a bit of the vertebral body here. There's a transit process. 
and yeah, that's that's not a bad view there. Okay, so we have got this is all psoas muscle down in here, and this muscle up here that's flying like a flag off the transverse process is our QL. So this is our QL plane right there between psoas, uh, psoas and QL. Now over here you have some motion. You can see as James breathes in, he uh, that's some retroperitoneal fat, and this is kind of a dividing line right there between what's not moving and what is moving. And so, yeah, you can put the local anywhere along this line, but I would keep it in nice and tight mm -hmm. where it's not moving. Probably not going to hurt much out here, but you're just going to waste your local in the fat. So it looks a wee rumble of a comment online. Somebody commented, but your model is very thin. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's just a coincidence. We didn't plan that at all <laughs> to make things easy and to look good while we're scanning. No, no, that's just pure coincidence. Uh, it's true. And, and, also, and honestly, like if, I, if I'm considering abdominal wall blocks and I have someone whose BMI is 50, I'm probably going to think twice about QL mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. maybe choose something more anterior, like a tap or something. But... Mm -hmm. This is, uh, that's, that's, that's a nice QL. And you can but do both QLs on the same side. So if we go back to, oh, yeah. back to the ultrasound view. Yeah, so there's one QL. There's my midline again. There's my lamina. Come down this way. There's my transverse process that way. And as I uh, collect some gel here, there we go. So there's my transverse process on the downside. And as I swing around, I've got, there's my QL plane right there between this QL muscle here and then this is psoas down here. So there's, there's my nice fascial plane right there. And we can they see look the, a bit different because one is being squished and one's not. And we can see the kidney, the inferior pole of the kidney yeah. just a little bit medial there as well. Deep breath there, James. So Ooh, study, kidney. We can, yeah, oh, there's the yeah. kidney. I'll probably put the vascular You can bill for that if you, if you biopsy the kidney. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody comments on the line, Taras, thank you, that you know, not everybody's QL is that size, and often the muscle can be a lot smaller. So when you're looking in patients, there is a lot of variability. Yeah, and even and you saw it like upside versus downside, James had a, a yeah. bigger QL. He does a lot of side crunches, mm -hmm. so that but helps Only on one side? <laughs> only on one side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's, somebody asked about a lumbar PVB, and really when you were showing that the, the lumbar ESP, you're, you're really just popping through that, 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 that fascia. Somebody said they were using it for vascular surgery. I asked if we do that, right. and my, my vascular surgeons often are just not quick enough yeah. um, for a lot of the cases. Um, some are embolectomies. I, you know, I just worry about the, you know, the, the block lasting long enough. But you uh, know, for analgesia, I certainly think yeah. so. I don't know if I would end up using it as an anaesthetic. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Okay, we um, trying to go back up and uh, look after people in the question. You ask a question if I'm at Pava, uh, more a teaching question. If you could pick your top three blocks for teaching, what would they be and why? Ooh. Um, oh, that's a good question. I, I, I wonder if he means, am I? What are the three blocks I'd want every trainee to walk away with? Maybe that's it. I, well, I just love teaching the auxiliary. Yeah. Oh, I just yeah. love spotting all the different uh, in yeah. nerves with that one. So that's one I really enjoy yeah, teaching, auxiliary nerve block. Um, little nerve simulations. You can see the different hand yep. twitches. Yep. Yeah. And the other one that's is a, 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 one of the, the more difficult ones is like a proximal sciatic and trying to teach, you know, find the greater trochanter, find the ischium, mm -hmm. make sure people understand the, the layers between the gluteus and the quadratus femoris to try and pick up the, yeah. the, the sciatic nerve. And it's great when you don't see it straight away, you like playing hunt the sciatic. So I one. find that a good challenge as well. I like the popliteal sciatic. I just love the, the sheath mm -hmm. and getting that. Nothing mm -hmm. is more elegant than when you get that mm -hmm. spread inside the sheath uh -huh. and you fill up both pant legs and mm, it's good. Yeah. So that's there's three. So I think we had <laughs> Stop. I, I, I answer that one. Now, uh, Gigi is asked about genicular blocks. Oh, Gigi, okay. All right. So, so. oh, this is quite a hot topic just now. And um, I was listening to this podcast for the discussed uh, Gigi. Uh, no, G, G, maybe Gigi asked the question because she was in the podcast too. But where, where people were, were discussing uh, 
Do you drink yellow blocks? Okay. Um, I wonder whose podcast that was. But uh, <laughs> it, um, I have to say, it seems like it takes a long time to do all those blocks. If I'm going to say that, if I'm going to be, be critical. A critical, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's funny, like we, you know, we've got it. So our total knee package now is spinal and then lay them on the side, eye pack, adopted canal, and then jinketer, jinketer, jinketer. And our record, James's record, is less than 10 minutes for neuraxial block and then all those peripheral blocks. So, oh, okay. so um, of course, it depends on the anatomy, too. So here, no, for okay. the geniculars, what we're going to do is, so you've got your, your operative leg here. Historically, the pain docs would do superior medial, superior lateral, and inferior medial, but avoid the the um, inferior lateral because of fear for getting the common peroneal nerve as it comes around the, the neck of the fibula there and cause a foot drop, right? So, so we started with one, two, three. And to get the, the superior lateral, superior medial, the approach is the same. So kind of like 10 and two here. And what you're aiming to do is image the femur, which we have here, okay? So soft tissue on top, nice bright cortex of the femur. And then I'm gonna slide down until I see it start to flare up. And you can see the flare right there. So that's a flare of the epicondyle. Sometimes if you're lucky, you can see a little genicular artery somewhere around there at the sort of base of the ski slope, but not always necessary. You're not gonna see the nerve either, and that's okay. So you just, you know, you know you're in the right spot. And a little reality check is, once you've got that flare centered, that should correspond exactly with the top of the patella. If you see where my thumb is, it's hitting the center of the probe. So that's good, a little reality check. And then I'll come out of plane and go boink, 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 and then come down and just hit the femur, aspirate, inject three cc's right there. And you'll see that whole soft tissue lift up off the bone. Then we'll do the mirror image on the medial side. So same thing, find the, find the femur, slide down until we get our flare. And then, so I would do this right about here. It's got a little flicker there of the genicular artery, right there. So don't hit the artery if you can, just go right beside it. And then for the inferior medial, um, <clears throat> it's the, this part of the, the flare of the tibia on the medial tibia. And you put the probe on there, you see they'll have a little shallow bowl. And oftentimes you'll see a vessel here as well of the genicular artery. I don't really see one in him, but that's okay. And then, so again, this is really shallow, just one centimeter down, hit the bone, layer out two or three mils of local in there, and that's that. And then for the, there's a what's called the recurrent um, genicular nerve, uh, which is the inferior, one of the inferior lateral ones. So if you look at the tibia in cross section here, and then come off in the lateral side, and if you go over, that's the fibula, there, we don't want to get that. So on the tibia, right there on the on that ski slope, you can bring a needle in out of plane, just hit that and just layer another two or three mils right in there. So that's one, two, three, four geniculars, and, <clears throat> and all those come off of the, the sciatic nerve and um, and and come around to, to innervate the front. And one last one we'll do while we're here is the nerve to vastus intermedius, which rides along the top of the femur at 12 o'clock here. You just see we've got a transverse image here, just about two or three centimeters above the patella. And uh, it innervates the patella itself. And so we'll just come down with a, our last three mils of local, hit that right there, and then layer it on top of the bone. So those are pretty quick, because they're out of plane, and you're not trying to line up your needle and your probe and your bone. So just mm -hmm. boom, 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 boom. And I, I suppose the big change from chronic pain was putting in a really small volume, trying to be precise. Yeah. And then the object of the game here is you, you put a, a lot in and that is, that, that's going to spread. We're using a different volume from people with chronic pain are putting a very small volume to get as close to where they're going to make the lesion with cool RF yeah, or whatever right. they're using. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, yeah, that's, that's totally, yeah. totally changed that. Yep. Cool. Um, Let's uh, see, trailing through uh, other questions here. Um, somebody was asking, and this kind of fits with something that was published just this month, a uh, scanning of proximal, mid, and distal adductor canal blocks. Ooh, okay. Um, 
I mean, I, I must admit, I end up going to the same place yeah. if, every, if, if, more or less every time. I have the archery in the midpoint. Beneath. Creature of habit. Yep, I have uh, one trick archery beneath the, 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 usually between the midpoint or, or where it's immediately in the middle of the, the muscle, uh, yeah. the muscle. I don't, yeah. do you push it right down or follow it, follow it down? No, nah, same, we go exactly mid-thigh and that seems to be a nice balance between, well A, it's easy to visualize there because the artery is right underneath the sartorius. Mm -hmm. So easy to visualize, you can usually see the saphenous, if not the nerve to vastus medialis and you get a nice um, balance between good visualization and getting a lot of the nerves that you want to get. So uh, the more proximal you go, you'll, in theory, get more branches of the femoral as mm -hmm. you get closer and closer to the mm -hmm. to the groin crease. But of course, we don't want to actually get the motor branches. So, so yeah, I had a, had a, a text from a former resident you know, to me and a couple of other folks that uh, trained him, and he's like, "Hey, um, have any of you had a motor block?" Hmm. with the without canal block and have you had that much of a problem you're trying to get your patients home yeah, trying to get them walking yeah. yeah I mean I think in the early days we were using bigger volumes like 30 mils and that mm -hmm. sort of crept up once and or twice you and push up the concentration as well yeah so I think keeping the volume yeah, yeah. 15 20 cc's and keeping the concentration lower yeah I think I been using like 0.2 percent rapivacaine for, for mine yeah so you be 0.125 or bup and I think that way you can avoid that. that motor. But the question was like proximal distance. Let, let's just try and scan the artery yeah. and let's look for the nerve. So put on the uh, switch to the scan cam and then put the um, scan well, cam. We'll, we'll, we'll go over to the ultrasound and put the picture in picture so we we'll can right. see what you're doing now. So this is this is where I would start. And so this is here's I'm going to estimate that's about mid thigh and. I usually aim to get that artery smack dab in the center of sartorius. And then on the lateral side, you can see a little hypercoic smudge, which we're going to assume is the saphenous nerve. And then somewhere in this plane will be the nerve to vastus medialis. Now, it may be that the nerve is right there. Sometimes they're quite close. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's way out here. Yep. And so, so we're big fans of nerve stimulation as you come across. And then all of a sudden you get this nice, brisk medial vastus twitch. Um, so that's that's what we're used to seeing. Stop yeah. just there for me yeah. for a second, Jeff. Be what is that to. bright bright thing behind the artery? Is that a nerve right at six o'clock? Here, that is uh, most likely artifact. Yeah, yeah. So it's post cystic enhancement from um, that artery. Actually, there's a vein there too if you release the pressure. But yeah, like, easily fooled. Um, yeah. I was back in the old days with the <laughs> axillary brachial plexus but, block and the. Uh, but the person that makes the slide is always correct. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if we if we slide if we follow that artery down toward the knee, the distal, you'll see what it starts to the sartoria starts to slide off um, the artery, and we still see the saphenous nerve there. Still right about there. Um, but the, another thing that happens is the artery gets much less distinct as it begins its dive into the popliteal fossa. So for this reason, it's not in contact with the, with the muscle. It's a little bit less distinct. Yeah, I can see that nerve, but where's the nerve to vastus? I'm not really sure. I like to do it there. That's a much more um, sort of pleasing image to me. Now, if you go further up north, the same, the reverse things, the reverse thing happens, so you sartorius slides off um, on the lateral side, and you could probably get <clears throat> a similar view here. What often happens is um, it just makes the saphenous nerve a little bit trickier to mm -hmm. to see. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to be said for that that view right there in the mm -hmm. middle. Somebody's asking us, hey, can you show us those cuties? So go back to camera three for the cutie shot. Oh no, that's not what they're talking about. Oh. Um, somebody's asking for those cuties, please. <laughs> <laughs> the um, yeah, the anterior. So what the cuties? Yeah, so the, so we've done all these blocks, right? And, mm -hmm. and we're getting all the guts of the knee. Mm -hmm. But what we've realized is that we're not getting 
the cutaneous parts, right, over the, the patella. Okay. Uh, save for the saphenous nerve, so you get yeah. a bit of the saphenous, but um, it has to account for something, because they're yeah. making that incision right over the kneecap, and so why not put some local in the subcutaneous area, and you could just do a field block, uh, obviously, but why not make it fun? And so here is our I'm just gonna tilt your leg. Right, a bit let's back. go to camera two here and do picture in picture. Folks can see what's going on. So we're back to our um the canal view and we've got the left side of the screen is medial. And what I'll do is I'll go to the medial edge of Sartorius and just kind of scan back and forth. And what I'm looking for is a little raspberry that exists just above the deep fascia of the thigh, which is this fascia right here. I'm looking kind of in this layer for little raspberries. That looks like a little raspberry, but I'll tra track it back and forth. Yep, it's tracking. So I'm gonna call that one of usually two or three cuties. And then once I got that one, I'll come back across the leg, the thigh rather, and do some scanning. There's one there. So that's a second one. So you can scan that guy back and forth. Yep, it's tracking. So, ooh, nice juicy one. And then, so that's two. And then come over here. And that. I could be convinced that that is a third one right there. So it just takes a little bit of scanning back and forth. And usually by the time you get to the third one, you're over far enough on the thigh that you're starting to get the branches of the lateral femoral cutaneous, which is what that might be right there. So I'll just stop with uh, kind of the, the one, two, and three over here. Sometimes they're hiding in a little bubble of fascia in between these two layers, but they're easy to do, they're fun, and uh, and um, effective enough. I did them all myself once, of course, because you got to find out. Do they? But yeah, they actually, work? I stimmed myself, and you can actually get the paresthesia down where they, you know, they're uh -huh. innervating, and uh, and then block them. And man, you could have taken pliers and squeezed my the skin over my knee for twenty hours with quarter percent BP. It was. It was. Hopefully, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Get the pliers out. I then woke up. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. and, um, so I think I think they add something. Uh -huh. And so and, and easy enough to do. Low risk. Just three three little blocks. Three 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 little yeah. blocks. So three little pigs. Three little cuties. And do you think if you just if you can't see them, just spreading a, a ring in? The, I think that it makes sense. Uh, I have done it as well. Yeah, because sometimes I think they branch earlier and you, instead of seeing these three raspberries you see these tiny little things so I think uh, yeah do some infiltration could work too. Okay yeah um, we've got some other things a uh, um, uh, questions asked about scanning but I, I want to say a little thank you um, my local uh, Sonicide rep has, uh, has provided us a fantastic machine here uh, so this is actually done in my basement um, and how we set this up uh, Je Jeff is the, the scanner and the talker, and I'm trying to look at the YouTube feed as well as with my amateur hour uh, production skills, uh, <laughs> point the view from one camera to the next. So there's well, nothing got, amateur about this. We've got we've got two cameras and an also plugged into a mixer that allows us to do picture in picture, but a couple of microphones, and then we're hopefully uh, streaming still to the internet so people can see what's going on. So <laughs> that. That's our setup here. Um, uh, one of the questions here, like one somebody's asking about um, a question about rectus sheath blocks. and said, if you do them, somebody says, I've noticed that they, they last less than 12 hours. Hmm. Which, I know we get blocks that last longer, but, but actually if your paper's published looking at interscaling blocks, at an average in studies, if you put the block in before the surgery, it's only lasting eight hours post-op for a single shot interscaling. So maybe the fact you're getting 12 hours, hours of your rectus sheath is, is not so bad. I think we can go ahead and, and scan the rectus sheath here. We've just start, done some work in, in the cadaver lab and, and actually tried to fill up that space 
with dye and notice that 20 mils isn't enough and you actually end up putting a lower concentration increasing the volume to 30 mils mm. and you can get a block of the complete rectus sheath muffle from the ziffy sternum all the way right yep. down to pubis but low concentration larger volume to get the spread if the incision is extensive of course if it's not that big an incision you can reduce the volume to and put in a, a appropriate so so let's uh, any we, comment we, on that yeah totally and we've done catheters as well in patients mm -hmm. that we think are going to need it for two or three days yep. and um as well as other adjuvants too so you know you can't extend it beyond this the 12 if you if you okay. need to. We'll have a look at the camera here, see where the probe's going first of all. And all right. We'll the second. Okay. So there we go. So I'm going to go periumbilical. Peri so just right there. And OMG, James. Someone's <sighs> been doing their sit ups. All right. So we got. He's brought the A game again. again you know? <laughs> got some subcutaneous tissue here. This so is. In a, in a steakhouse here. It's uh, <laughs> the Wagyu here, the marbled uh, <laughs> uh, pepper. So we've got the rectus muscle here. It looks like a boat shape or a lens shape. Um, and characteristically, there's this double white line, the trolley tracks on the bottom. That's the posterior rectus sheath. And of course, below here is preperitoneal fat. And once in a while, you get a view of the peritoneum itself. And so that's a no-fly zone. You don't want to go there. What you can also see in this picture is um, that there are... Occasionally, there's some big vessels, the epigastric artery and vein uh, run within this. So it's a good, a good idea. It's always a good idea to put Doppler on and just make sure your trajectory isn't going to go through a vessel. Um, but that's a decent sized vessel. So, um, like Stuart said, we just usually do them at the umbilicus and put a decent volume in and get it spreading up to the xiphoid and down to the pubis. So your goal here is to bring a needle in from, <clears throat> from lateral. So this way, and then uh, come through the Wagyu and land just here, just above the trolley tracks. So not between the tracks, but lifting the muscle off those, off those trolley tracks. You saw a second ago that as we scanned up, things kind of looked condensed right there. It looks like a, the muscle got cloudy. That's actually um, <clears throat> the tenderness intersection of James's six pack. So if we go further, it gets like, looks more like muscle again. So if you see that, just scan up or down. Don't go too far down um, below the umbilicus though, because there, <clears throat> you get to the arcuate line where there's a, an absence of that rectus sheath. So the next thing after the muscle is, is preperitoneal fat. Now, if you're scanning, it's good. And you need a visualization, it's good. You can do the block down there, but it's good to have those yeah. two layers of fascia. And the arcuate yeah. line will not stop the spread of local anesthetic. It will yeah. spread down. So you're putting the local anesthetic in front of that fascial plane. So it will go all the way down to pubis. Yep. Good one. One of my favorites. Yep. Yep. I, I, um, I, I think it's great. Often patients come in, elective surgery, we're all planned. And so much of it's in our place is now robotic, laparoscopic, small incisions. Um, but it's the emergency case and there's never time to get the block done beforehand and often at the end of the case yeah. you know you're, you're getting more of the history coming in you find out that patient's on chronic opioids or whatever and we'll put rectus yeah. sheath captors in at the, the end of the case for these the, the, these open abdominal surgeries. One of the first cases I had where I did this that made me a believer was a young kid gunshot wound x lap in the middle of the night and we decided i had an aggressive resident on that night who said hey let's do some blocks i'm like yeah, sounds good we'll do rectus sheath blocks and he woke up and he's we asked him do you have any pain no i feel great i can't feel my incision i feel great so worth more than you'd think in terms of mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. analgesic benefit um, so I'm, I'm having difficulty keeping up with the chat here. Thank you yeah. very much for all your comments. I'm trying to catch the things that we can. Uh, what kind of pumps are you using for bilateral rectus sheath catheters? I use a petrol pump. What about you? <laughs> well, I, I don't like the on cue with the splitter because I, I get, depending on the resistance, you've got yeah. different flows. So for all our inpatients, we actually use the electronic pumps. So it's two electronic pumps, both going at very low rate and then you know, with an intermittent mandatory bolus on top rather than just yeah. a continuous infusion. Um, I know some people use it with 
bilateral um, elastomeric pumps or disposable electronic pumps or, or other options. But I don't like the yeah, no, the, it, the, the you get thing. uneven. One, one side of the belly looks like this, and the other side is, is flat. But the, the nice thing you can do with these intermittent boluses, too, is you can stagger them. So we'll do, like, time zero, the left side gets 30 mils, and then at time, or 20 mils, rather, and then at three hours later, the right side gets 20 mils, and then back and mm -hmm. forth. So you're not giving, you know, a big dump of local all at once. A couple of comments here, people using these in trauma, other people using, using them for umbilical hernias. Yeah, and the... For the umbilical hernia, it's fantastic. It gets those patients. They're usually day cases. Mm. Good for an ambulatory surgery center and getting patients home. For yep. sure. Um, going to switch it up. We've got a couple of comments about people. Somebody wants to see auxiliary, and after maybe our comments at the start, auxiliary to the elbow. Let's follow out those Ooh, individual nerves. Yeah. Um, Go on a little then, journey. And then somebody asked for a supraclavicular. And um, I got a a fantastic invite uh, to talk at a, a college study day where we had, to talk about alternatives for shoulder surgery um, and I was talking about doing the the supra um, the supra scapular nerve uh, oh yeah work. so well, let's, let's first of all we'll go with the God's request for uh, an axle okay so, okay, we'll put this so. One to camera one so we can see where Jeff's going, and uh, we've got the close-up armpit cam there, okay? So, <laughs> That's good. He, more by the James way, James, you... James shaved his armpit last night. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> prolific armpit hair growth. Um. So you see where his pec inserts onto the, uh, the arm here. That's where we're going to start, right there at that crease. And we put it on, and sure enough, we see the axillary artery, which is right here. Now this is, this structure here is the conjoint tendon of teres major and lat dorsi. And so that comes down and attaches, you have insertion, a common insertion on the humerus. You have to see that. If you, a common mistake people make is they drift down a little bit and now I don't see any big wide diagonal slash across the screen that I did there. And the implication is if you don't see conjoint tendon, your radial nerve may have already started to dive down you towards the humerus. You can diving down there. Yeah. If you go down a little bit further, you'll see the different heads, of the, the, the various heads of the, the short head, the tricep, and you can see the, the, the split. The, the great thing about that muscle, you'll see you know, that conjoint tendon, the, the fibers are running across the screen. Yeah. And all the other muscles are running up and down the arm. Cross so that's, section. it makes it easy to pick out. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you should see the one where the fibers are coming across. I call this the US Postal Eagle. If you look at a US postage stamp, uh, it looks okay. the beak of the eagle there going over the, the, the humerus. It's very patriotic no, of you. Yeah, that's yeah. me. Okay. I picked up the accent, picked up the yeah, lingo. You, you talk just like a North Carolinian. Yep. It's amazing. Uh, okay, so we've got the, um, the artery. And as you can see, if I press with any amount of force, I obliterate all the veins. And then I lift it up and ooh, big old axillary vein there. And another smaller vessel over here. So it's very easy to inadvertently get your needle into one of those veins without, without um, too much trouble. But what you can see, if you do a little bouncing, and I like to bounce the probe a bit because it tells me that this structure here, which looks hypoechoic, looks a lot like this thing, is not in fact a vessel. I can't compress it. So that's our median nerve right there. And then over to the side, on this side, we have this structure here, which is our ulnar nerve. Okay, so median typically on the up or lateral or anterior side, ulnar typically there. Sometimes it can be over here, so you have to sort of do a little searching around. And then radial typically lies here at six o'clock. So that's median, ulnar, Radial, and then out here in this plane within corca brachialis is our snake eyes of musculocutaneus. And he's kind of fun to sort of, usually two fascicles, one, two there. And typically the brightest nerve in the body it has a nice distinct sheath. So <clears throat> what I would do for James here, I would start here, bring a needle in from the anterior side and do three passes. So first pass, sort of peel that radial nerve off the inferior part of the artery, put five or 10 mils there, come back, and then I gotta peel my median off the top of the artery, and either one of those two injections will flow backwards and get the ulnar as well. So that's one, one two. That's, this part is just a periarterial block. So if you get local around the artery, you will get 
a blockade of the brachial plexus, which is what we always did back, you know, in the transarterial technique. And then the third injection, pull the needle back and then land in this plane and just put like five mils there to surround or contact that nerve. But for funsies, let's try tracing these because that's a really, really interesting thing to do. So let's keep our pointer on the median. And this is not just an academic exercise either. Sometimes you put the probe here in the target position and nothing looks like this. And you're like, I, I can't tell where my nerves are. And so tracing down towards the elbow can be helpful. So our median is going to stay with the brachial artery as we get down towards the elbow. Here's me walking and chewing gum at the same time. So there we go. So Oh, yeah. We got to his elbow. There we go. So straighten your arm there. Just rest your arm on my armpit. That's nice. Okay. Um, and then here we are in the elbow crease itself. And you see you have our brachial artery, median nerve right there. And then now we're in the forearm. And the median nerve lies in this fascial plane. And we can trace it down. Here we are in between the two flexor groups. And... Now we're in that flexor group. If you look, you're... Well down there, the, almost near the, the wrist. Yeah. If you work your way immediately in the forearm in that same fascial plane, you're going to find the ulnar. So you, oh, there we right go, right beside the ulnar artery. So ulnar Made nerve. for TV moment, yeah. There we go. And follow that fascial. Plane. So let's go that. Let's go up on the ulnar and trace that bad boy up to oh. the axilla. We need just, more goop. We just need to bathe James in goop. He, he he doesn't have to bathe in gel. He just chooses to. So there we are coming up to the elbow, and you can see that that ulnar nerve spends a bit of time in this groove right there, and then pops out again. And it hangs off. I lost a little bit, Jim. Oh, there we are. There we are. Right it hangs off the fa yeah, deep fascia of the arm as we come up towards the axilla. Saying, hi, gang. Welcome there back. There we are. Thanks a lot. We're back. We're hey, back. We're back. And then we get our good friend, the conjoint tendon. And there's the radio. If you want to follow that radio. Yeah, down. the radio. So That's there's. It's getting towards the humerus. Now, the tough thing about this is it winds around in the spiral groove. There it is. There we go. Look at this. So it's, you, what's the vessel? What's the radio? I'm not sure. That's probably the radio yeah, right there in the somewhere. arrow. Yep. Yep. And we're going to lose it in a second. Yeah. So it'll, it'll wind around James' arm and then emerge on this side. There it is there, uh, right in the middle of the screen. Right there. Oh, yeah. yeah, good. And so, yeah, we kind of skipped a bit there. There it, there it is, up mid-arm on the humerus. And then as you get into the elbow crease, it comes around. Yeah, so a good place to block it right there. Now, so if you, if you want to look for the, if you keep on the elbow there, if you actually straighten his elbow, if you put your hand on his, um, the oh. ligament of his bicep, okay, if you go one finger breath medial, you're going to find the median nerve. And if you go one finger breath lateral to that bicep's tendon, just at the, the groove, you're going to find the, 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 the radial. So just put his hands on there. Sometimes you get them both on the same screen, but often I find I'm going to look for... So there's the median, uh, there's yeah, the artery. Artery, median nerve, and then let's look the other direction. So then, and then there's... There we are. Radial nerve tucked in yeah. there. So you can get both your, your, your radial... Radial and median. And the median, popped in there, both at, at, at the elbow. Nice. Hmm. Um, should we talk Superscapula. Oh, let's talk Are you an anterior or a posterior superscapula? It all depends. It's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. No, no, no. Right. I'm team posterior. Me too. Because um, my feeling is if you're doing that block, the whole point is you're trying to avoid the phrenic nerve, right? Because if I'm doing shoulder surgery, gold standard, interscaling brachial plexus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not everybody can get one of those because of fear for <clears throat> hemidiaphragmatic paresis. So if I'm going to skip... If I'm going to reduce my risk to zero of phrenic nerve paresis, I'm going to go posterior and do that. Okay. So maybe, James, you turn on your side. That'd be great. Okay. I usually do this sitting, <clears throat> but for James's convenience, we'll do this on his side. Okay. So let's get a wide view. You can see. Can you see? 
my hand. Kind of. Kind yeah. of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm trying to do here what is... What the audience can see, we're thankful here that Mike Gonzalez is about six foot six. And looming <laughs> over us, he's going to have a sore arm in a minute or two, so we'll, we'll let him get more comfortable in a second. So my first landmark is the spinal scapula, which I can feel right mm -hmm. here, yeah. like across. And it's, sort of, it's angled towards the front as well, on sort of an angle. I'm going to actually put my fingers of my left hand, my uh, non-dominant hand, on the spine because that guides my probe to land right in front of them and I'm looking down. Mm. Oh, let me just get this and, camera yep. two up, uh, picture in picture. There we go. Okay. And so medial is right side of the screen and lateral is, is left. And what you can see is the, um, whoops, arrow, yeah. So this is trapezius muscle, this thin one up here. This muscle here is supraspinatus muscle. And this is the bowl it's of the it's bone created by the scapula of the supraspinatus fossa. And so down here is a little dip and you can see the transverse ligament there. Within this little spinal glenoid notch, you have um, vessels and the suprascapular nerve. Now you'll read some descriptions of bringing a needle in from medial and landing in the notch. Um, I prefer to do this like a peng block where I come down and land here and just lift the muscle up and let the local drizzle into the, it's like a cooking show, drizzle into the notch because um, there's at least one description I've heard of where someone went into the notch and then went into the lung. So, um, no body cavity could not be reached. <laughs> yeah. With a port engaged needle. So that's strong. Right yeah. Now. So that's yeah. a nice one. Super scapular nerve block. Okay. Um, is that how you do it as well? Yep. Um, I, I don't always see the beautiful sort of ligament just across the top there. I don't always see that as. James is here for hope. a reason. Yeah, James is picked, hand-picked, um, and uh, but um, I'll just go to the, the you know the, the bottom of the trough. It's been my my bottom feeder after all. I'll go to the bottom of that trough and and, and <laughs> placed a uh, you know ten cc yeah. of oak there, and I found it to be very effective. Yep. Right it there. doesn't give you if I can, and I combine this with an infraclavicular brachial plexus block for yeah. my for my shoulder surgeries. That's my. Um, that's my go-to combo for patients when I don't want to do an interscaling. Yeah. Superscapular and air block posterior combined with an infraclavicular brachial plexus block is uh, that's how I look at that. And that kind of reconstitutes the interscaling, right, from its pieces. I'm trying to get, and I'm hopefully we're doing that infraclavicular. I'm getting the axillary nerve, not an axillary nerve block, but the, the, the axillary yep. circumflex nerve and the nerve to subscap. That's the only thing you're missing from that supply of the rotator cuff. So hopefully I'm getting, I'm not getting the skin mm. and I'm not getting T2 for a low anterior port. If it's a, or a low anterior incision, you may get some pain down there and also some of the skin, but you can do a you know, superficial cervical plexus yeah. block um, uh, with ultrasound to, to try and pick up that piece. And but, again, this is, I'm doing this as a plan B when I can't do interscaling. So I'm willing to put up with a little bit of discomfort mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. the sake of sparing the phrenic. So if somebody's made a comment, a superior trunk would also get you away from the phrenic. So superior trunk, supraclavicular, both alternatives, but none of these guarantee you will not get the phrenic. It's going to be a less frequent and a, and a shorter duration if you do get it, mm. but you cannot guarantee you will not get the phrenic with either of those approaches, unfortunately. So I think, yes, for patient satisfaction, I, I don't go as high in the neck as I, as I, as mm. I used to. I don't think you need to go as high as those, the, the, the old traffic lights you'd see with a classic interscaling approach. But um, certainly, yeah. if I really need to avoid it, suprascapular and an infraclavicular um, is going to be how I'll, how I'll approach my, 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 sh yeah. my shows. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, what else? Pretty good. Um, I think we're going to go now. We'll have a few questions about a sciatic nerve. Uh, oh, somebody okay. asking about... A subgluteal going up to parasacral. We'll see how far proximally. <laughs> we got to worry about James because James's mom said he's not allowed to show his butt in public. So we're going to be careful here. We don't upset James's mom. James's mom. But also somebody said about an anterior sciatic. Okay. Which I show at workshops and maybe do once a year for MFB. Yeah. Maximum, maximum fellow, fellow benefit. benefit. And that's probably very rarely need to do it because often with ultrasound, I've got to like 
do a like figure of four or frog leg, which means I've got to move the limb. And, and, and well, I, let's, I let's try it. Let's see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see, see, we'll see what we get. Okay. okay. So um, let's, James, if you could um, take your shirts off. Take I mean, sh um, yeah, let's maybe get a towel and keep them a little bit more modest before we get the close-up cam in on this one. Um, I, I'll just, uh, I'll come, I'll come from below first, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Let's put a towel over it. Yeah. There yeah. we go. Uh, on second thought. I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's better to come this way. Yeah, okay, put the towel over. Keep this, keep the mystery. We don't need to show the hand cam on this one. No, maybe. We'll, <laughs> we'll keep the hand cam on that. If that's and, okay, James, yeah, that's I'll good. just pull this down a bit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> My, so what I would do typically is um, feel for the right, greater trochanter. Now we're, now we're there. Uh, Mike, do you want to uh, pick up that and we'll, we'll show us that where, we're, where we're going? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, feel for okay, the... Greater trochanter. Greater trochanter. Yep, there. And then my other bony landmark, bones don't lie. Bones don't lie. Is my ischial tuberosity, which is there. And everyone's got a trough right there between the trochanter and tuberosity. And the sciatic nerve lives in that trough. Okay, and let me get this so, up and put some picture. And so we're trying to look for the greater trochanter. And one thing I find in, in patients who've got high BMI is I'm not sure where the greater trochanter is. So I actually scan up the leg till I go past it. And when I go high up the legs, you just scan proximally, it disappears, then I come back down. So I know I'm not just on the femur, I am at the greater trochanter. Yeah. Because going between the greater trochanter and the ischium lets me find the quadratus femoris. I love the way you say ischium. So, so, so trochanter over here, this is his ischial tuberosity. And then we have gluteus maximus here. Mm -hmm. I'll draw your attention to the sublime definition of this gluteus maximus. Um, this is quadratus femoris muscle below in this fascial plane. This, here's a fascial plane here that's slung like a hammock between the trochanter and the tubero um, ischial tuberosity. So, and then within that fascial plane, you'll usually see this triangular shaped hyperechoic nerve typically a little closer to the ischium than the trochanter. And there it is there. So I'll just So do James little... isn't even a tease. His satin nerve is so easy to see. But so yeah. often with patients, and even slim patients, um, I'll have difficulty. I'll see the landmarks. I can yeah. find the greater, uh, the gluteus maximus. I can see quadratus femoris. I can see the fascial plane, but I don't see the sciatic nerve. It, but well, I know it's in that fascial plane. Yeah. And I'll scan down, tilting the probe backwards and forwards as I go, and often as I go to the subgluteal, the, the, a little bit further down, the sciatic nerve will, will appear. But for, providing you get the, the correct fascial plane by finding yeah. the, the, the greater trochanter, the ischial, <coughs> quadratus femoris, finding that first fascial plane, it's got to be in there. If you can see these two bones, it's there somewhere. Yep. It, it doesn't just drill a hole through either one of these bones. So, mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll often, I mean, we don't use nerve stimulation for every block, but this is one we'll pull it up more often than not because it's nice to have that functional confirmation that, yeah, that smudge really is the nerve as opposed to, you know, this thing over here or something. You can actually see there's a little, f like, gap between the two epimesial layers right here that James's nerve lives in. It's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. All right, so, and then, um, if we slide up, um, more gel, more gel, James, you're gonna, we're gonna hose you down afterwards, yeah. prison style. Um, okay, so now we have, we should actually use body glitter for fun next time, you just got to explain that at work the next day, that'd be, that would be fun. <laughs> Um, okay, so now we've got the probe. <clears throat> You've gone proximal and turned that probe a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so it's yeah. a little angled. Uh huh. Um, sort of 45, deg or 45 degrees to his spinal plane, aiming to catch the sciatic nerve as it comes out of the greater sciatic notch. And so what we're seeing, first of all, is um, ilium here, this nice, nice oh, broad yeah. ilium going mm -hmm. down. And as we, as we go straight down distal, you find a break in the ilium, and that's the greater sciatic notch. Okay. 
and sometimes people yeah there it is there yeah so come back up and disappears yeah, yeah. yeah it's not a great example of Now, the parasecral block, I, I, I used to use this for a uh, hip arthroplasty combined with a posterior lumbar plexus block, all done with a nerve stimulator. Yeah. And um, it was in cases where I'm really trying to avoid, you know, any other type of anesthesia at all, parasecral yeah. and a posterior lumbar plexus. And um, <clears throat> using the nerve stimulator, I, I managed to hunt and peck. Why I love ultrasound so much, I'm hunting, I'm hunting, I'm hunting. And I walked off the edge of the sacrum and I stimulated somebody's pudendal nerve. And this old lady was yelping off the bed. It's, it's right um, there, yeah. Which, so uh, I, going that close, it's I think ultrasound it, 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 is, is an, it certainly is an advantage compared to <coughs> used to do things before. Um, let's try um, the anterior sciatic, an yeah. anterior sciatic nerve. So we'll get James pull the right. shorts up and change position and um, let's might get the camera in there. I'm going to externally rotate your leg a bit there. So kind of like the same position as your adductor. And I'm going to go, again, anterior medial. Now, I've still got the curved probe because I want to see uh, a deep, a deep layer. And what you can see here is, okay, so arrow. here's our adductor canal way up here. And this is sartorius muscle femoral artery, we've got our, our femur here. This is uh, vasus uh, medialis, and this is um, our uh, adductor group of muscles here. So, Dr. Longus over here, Magnus, Magnus. is this big mm -hmm. one coming in from the medial side. Mm -hmm. And then in the plane between a Dr. Magnus and the hamstrings down here, you'll often see this bright hyperechoic structure, which is the sciatic nerve. So well, one thing you've done here to, to make this obvious, if you have frog legged uh, the, the leg yeah. here. And yeah. um, Often, this block was described for trauma patients, like a bad tibial, uh, a tibial and fibula ankle fracture, or um, some other like injury in the, the lower limb. Yeah, where so, you can't but, turn them Where you over. can't turn the leg. Yeah. And, and so if you put the leg absolutely straight, so James, okay. you just put the leg, leg straight? It's, it's really it's now possible, close, but and it's possible. A little less easy, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you scan up, you can actually see the lesser trochanter sort of hanging out there and the, uh, over it in the, the medial side. So I tend to go distal to that lesser trochanter. There's a, there's a good view there. Um, and one one thing I find, it's it, not everybody is as obvious as James's sciatic nerve. So <clears throat> a little trick here is if you take the distance from the artery to the edge of femur here and you mirror that, down, it's usually the same distance. So it creates an equilateral triangle here. And so that's, that gives you a place to look, at least, if you can't, if it's not quite as obvious. So I would come, and again, the trick is, do I, you know, it'd be very hard to come in plane here from the corner and not hit femur to get to here. So out of plane, straight down, would be a good trajectory. Nice one. Phenomenal. So we, we said we'd be, be, be doing this for an hour uh, just because we're hungry. We're getting to actually clo 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 <laughs> close, to, close to time here. Um, there's a few requests. Somebody here, um, I don't know if I managed to get, get through all of this, but let, let, there's one. Somebody asking the infraclavicular region scanning mm -hmm. from the costoclavicular to the lateral uh, infraclavicular fossa. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, if you're going to do an infraclavicular approach, do you end up scanning all the way along, or do you pick one particular? Um, the question is how lateral or medial do you go on the mm -hmm, chest? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So first things first, my favorite brachial plexus block. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna put James's arm out to the side, because that's gonna <clears throat> bring the artery up a little bit closer to the surface. And if I can, I'm gonna feel for his um, coracoid process, which is a little knob of bone right 
there, part of the scapula. And then that guides my hand to put the probe, flip it around, just medial to that. And if I do that, what I should see is OMG again, James. Let me just okay. show this, uh, go to the camera and do picture in picture. So, <sighs> James, bring it's it like we planned this. Once again. So you can <laughs> see um, this is all um, pec major. Someone's been doing their push ups. And then uh, this is pec minor. And you can see the fibers to Stuart's point earlier. These are in total cross section, whereas the pec minor fibers are more longitudinal because that's the direction it goes. And below that, we have an axillary artery, axillary vein. And then you can actually see the three cords around the plexus. So that's the lateral cord, the posterior cord is down here, and then the medial cord is squished in between the two vessels. Now, if I go, yeah, so that's a good, good spot. What you can't see here is a clavicle because the act of bringing his arm up has swung the clavicle out of the way. So it gives, it gives you a place to bring the needle in from the superior aspect and come straight across and, and approach it. Now where you want to be is right here at six o'clock to the artery. So it's gonna require some negotiation with some hydrodissection carefully to get the needle safely past lateral cord to that spot. Now, pay attention to this, these two muscles, especially pec minor. If we go medial, we keep sliding medial, we, two things happen. We pick up chest wall, so you can see we have, um, bit of sliding pleura here and some rib and we've also lost that muscle we have pec, pec major still but no pec minor probably not an ideal spot come back because of the proximity to the chest wall so back to where we see two pec muscles and our beautiful cords that's awesome if we go lateral more lateral and lose the pec minor muscle again now we can barely see our artery as it goes into the axilla so my advice is always get a view where you're seeing pec minor and that should line you up um, in a good spot. Yep. So what about um, going as medial far as, um, as you can, scanning there and watching that artery duck under the clavicle? So here we are at the like, costoclavicular type mm -hmm. view there. So all the cords have now swung around to the uh, lateral side of the, <clears throat> of the artery. And so that's a, that's a commonly done approach as well, where you bring the needle in from this side. And uh, it's, it's like a mirror image of the supraclavicular, right? Yeah. Which it really, you know, you're, you're centimeters away from either one. So that's a nice costoclavicular there. Yep. And why don't you just keep scanning all the way to was underneath there? The, the okay, okay, okay. Come on, come all on. Right. There. There, clavicle. Boom. Brilliant. Just there. out. Yeah. And then we and then we go to the other side and oh, his arms up. Yeah. But yeah. So there's your uh, there's your uh, mirror image of artery and plexus. Okay. So it's amazing how how much these the, the, these oh, two, yeah. two two look like. In fact, I think that costoclavicular we got there doing a, an old um, uh, sub perivascular subclavian? Yeah, yeah, um, when, you, <laughs> when you did that, yeah, subclavian perivascular approach, so sort of the winning approach, I think you end up being behind the clavicle and, and going yeah. where that is. Um, we've had an hour. Yeah. There's been amazing input, and, and I can't talk and type barely can type, hunt and peck. <laughs> so I know we have missed some and there's some other requests. We might just come and do this again. We'll People keep doing this. External, yes. intercostal, plane block. We'll come back and do it another time. Yeah. yeah maybe like do some more, well, not any spine scanning, like epidurals or yeah. spinals and how to help with that. Um, please uh, stay involved. Let us know if there's anything else. Keep adding comments. Um, but we need to... Uh, get fed at the end of a busy work day. Um, if anyone's interested in the setup I've got, what we use, I'm happy to tell people all the bits and bobs. Um, just make Good. sure the Amazon boxes go to your work and don't arrive home so your wife complains about how much money you've spent on <laughs> audiovisual equipment is the only tip I can give people out there if they're in a relationship or their partner, whatever it is they're doing. Um, so um, thanks very much for yeah, tuning thanks. in. Thanks a lot, guys, and, for tuning in. Appreciate it. We'll see you next hope time. Hope we do this. It was six months since last one. We plan to do this much, much sooner again. Yeah.
Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Take care.